Well, thanks to all of you for coming to this important presentation by one of Iowa's leading officials on key issues related to the rule of law in the Iowa Supreme Court. Marcia Turnus is the first woman to serve as Chief Justice of Iowa's highest court. Chief Justice Turnus earned her law degree in 1977 from Drake University Law School with honors, Order of the Coif, and served as editor-in-chief of the Drake Law Review. She was appointed to the Iowa Supreme Court in 1993 by Governor Terry Branstad, and members of the court selected her as Chief Justice in 2006. Chief Justice Turnus has made the improvement of court, uh, of court oversight of child welfare cases a priority for the Iowa Judicial Branch. She led an effort to form, and she now chairs, the State Children's Justice Council, which consists of representatives of the Judicial Branch, state agencies, and private entities involved in the child welfare system. Chief Justice Turnus currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Conference of Chief Justices and is a member of the Conference's Courts, Children, and Families Committee. In addition, she chairs the Conference's Court Management Committee and its Resolution Committee. In 2009, United States Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts appointed her to the Judicial Conference Committee on Federal State Jurisdiction as one of only four state Supreme Court justices serving on the committee. Chief Justice Turnus is also a member of the American Bar Association's Bar Admissions Committee and participates in the C. Edwin Moore Inn of the American Inns of Court. Before joining the Iowa Supreme Court, Chief Justice Turnus worked in private practice in a major Des Moines law firm, emphasizing civil litigation and insurance law. While in private practice, she served as president of the Polk County Bar Association on the Board of Governors of the Iowa State Bar Association, on the Iowa Jury Instructions Committee, and on the Board of Directors of the Polk County Legal Aid Society. Chief Justice Turnus also served as president of the Board of Counselors of the Drake University Law School and on the Drake Law School Endowment Board of Directors. She is the recipient of the Drake University Law School Outstanding Alumnus Award. In addition to her judicial duties, Chief Justice Turnus has worked on a number of court initiatives and other efforts to improve the administration of justice. She served as a judicial branch representative on the Iowa Access Advisory Council, which was instrumental in encouraging and guiding electronic government projects. She also served on the judicial team that oversaw the design, development, and construction of the judicial branch building, where my daughter, by the way, worked in the law library. Chief Justice Turnus was a member of the steering committee of the Iowa Supreme Court Commission on Planning for the 21st Century and served as co-chair of the commission's administration team. She also served on the Multi-State Performance Test Policy Committee of the National Conference of Bar Examiners and chaired the law school task force of the Drake University Commission II toward the 21st century. Now, as you may know, the Iowa Supreme Court engages in difficult and often controversial decisions, such as the ruling last year regarding same-sex marriage. The Iowa Supreme Court is just that, supreme, and its decisions have an effect on all of us. Please join me in welcoming our very distinguished speaker, Marsha K. Turnus, Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court. Good evening. Am I close enough to the microphone so that you can hear? No. Okay. I hate to find out after half an hour of speaking that people couldn't hear me. Is that? Am I close enough now that everybody can hear? Yes? A little closer? Now my kids could, would just say, well, Mom, we know you can talk louder than that. And, <laughs> and they do. He forgot to mention the fact that I have, with my husband's uh, partnership, raised three children, too. That's more work than anything that he <laughs> listed, I think. Well, let me start by thanking Pat Miller for making the arrangements for this discussion about the rule of law and the Iowa Supreme Court. This is an important discussion, and I'm, I'm happy to see so many people came out tonight to join us. At this moment in history, our state stands at a crossroads. Voters are about to decide what kind of court system Iowans will have in the future. 
Now you may be thinking that I'm overstating the significance of the upcoming retention election of 74 judges. I'm not. This election is obviously important for those 74 judges, but it's even more important for you. Iowans who depend on the courts to protect their rights and to provide a fair and impartial forum for the resolution of disputes. So as we approach election day, it is important to discuss and understand the role of the courts and the judges who work in those courts. Dealing with controversial issues has always been part of being a judge. Our state and federal courts are routinely asked to decide cases that involve social and political issues about which our citizens disagree. Presently, the controversy is over same-sex marriage. More precisely, many Iowans disagree with the Iowa Supreme Court's 2009 decision in Varnum v. Breen that held an Iowa statute limiting civil marriage to a union between a man and a woman violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa Constitution. Public debate about the court system and the merits of court decisions is a healthy aspect of a democratic society. However, some of the current debate reveals a fundamental misunderstanding among a number of people about the role, authority, and vital importance of Iowa's fair and impartial courts. So tonight I begin my remarks by addressing some of these misconceptions about courts and court decisions, particularly court decisions involving the interpretation of the Constitution. Now we'll see how technologically skilled I am. Let me first talk about the rule of law. The rule of law is a phrase that is often used, but probably not universally understood. The rule of law is a system of self-government in which all persons, including the government, are accountable under the law. It is a process of governing by laws that are applied fairly and uniformly to all persons. Applying the rule of law is the sum and substance of the work of the courts. Under the rule of law, judicial decisions must be soundly supported by the law in the form of relevant statutory provisions, prior appellate court decisions known as legal precedent, and the Constitution. In this way, the rule of law creates predictability and consistency in the resolution of disputes between people and between pe the people and their government. Why does it create predictability and consistency? Because the same rules are applied in the same manner to everyone. And because the same rules are applied in the same manner to everyone, the rule of law protects the civil, political, economic, and social rights of all citizens, not just the rights of the most vociferous, the most organized, the most popular, or the most powerful. We, the people of the state of Iowa, created a government under the rule of law when we adopted the Iowa Constitution, which sets forth the fundamental rules and principles that govern our citizens and our government. In fact, the Iowa Constitution expressly states, this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land, and it goes on to say that any law inconsistent therewith shall be void. I'm sure everyone here understands that the legislature is the branch of government that enacts laws. What if a citizen thinks a law enacted by the legislature is inconsistent with the Constitution, violates the Constitution, or takes away the citizen's constitutional rights? Who decides whether the legislature's law is unconstitutional? The courts, of course, because the judicial branch is responsible for resolving disputes between citizens and their government. Some critics of courts maintain that courts have no power or authority to review the constitutionality of statutes. This view is flat out wrong. The power of courts to review acts of the legislature, to determine their constitutionality, and to declare unconstitutional statutes void or unenforceable is firmly embedded in our form of government. This authority, called judicial review, was understood by the delegates to the 1787 Constitutional Convention. 
it was a subject of the Federalist Papers. And if there was any question about the power, it was settled in 1803 by the United States Supreme Court in its landmark case, Marbury versus Madison. The power of the courts to exercise judicial review was also understood by the authors of our state constitution. Nonetheless, despite 200 years of American experience with judicial review, critics of the courts act as if this doctrine is late breaking news. In fact, state and federal courts are routinely called upon to support the constitution by determining whether a statute or local law violates the constitution. In the past 20 years alone, the Iowa Supreme Court has reviewed the constitutionality in of statutes in dozens and dozens of cases. For example, in 1998, the court protected the property rights of Clarence and Caroline Bo Borman of Kasuth County by ruling that a state law that gave hog lots nuisance immunity violated the Borman's due process rights. In 2006, the court protected the property rights of Walter and Jean Kistler by ruling that a city ordinance allowing the seizure of a city resident's property without a hearing violated the resident's right to due process. Unlike the Varnum decision, most court decisions, like those that I've mentioned, receive little or no attention. And so the Supreme Court has quietly performed its constitutional role protecting citizens' constitutional rights under the rule of law. Despite the well-established authority that courts have the power of judicial review, critics now exclaim that courts overstepped their power when they void statutes for constitutional infirmities. Critics claim that these decisions usurp the legislature's power. Again, these claims are wrong. As one of my predecessors on the Iowa Supreme Court has recently explained, the duty of courts to determine the constitutionality of statutes, statutes does not mean the judicial power is superior to legislative power. Rather, when the will of the legislature expressed in its statutes stands in opposition to the will of the people as expressed in the Constitution, the courts must prefer the Constitution over the statutes. When ruling that a statute violates the Constitution, the court does not usurp the powers of the other branches of government. The court exercises its own authority. The court is not legislating from the bench. It is resolving a dispute between the parties by declaring the legislature's act unenforceable because it violates the will of the people as expressed in their Constitution. And finally, the court does not overstep its constitutional role when it declares an unconstitutional statute void. To the contrary, the court fulfills its constitutional role when doing so. Claims that the courts must close their eyes to the principles expressed in our Constitution would subvert the will of the people who have declared that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. While there is no doubt that courts have the authority to declare unconstitutional statutes void, I must emphasize that courts do not take the power of judicial review lightly. When analyzing the constitutionality of a statute, courts try to construe a statute in a manner that will avoid a constitutional violation. There are many times that the Iowa Supreme Court has concluded a statute does not violate the Constitution. For example, in 2005, the court upheld a law that made it a crime for a person to intentionally infect another person with the HIV virus. The court ruled that this criminal statute did not violate a defendant's First Amendment rights or right to privacy. That same year, the court held that a statute that prohibited sexual predators from living within 2,000 feet of a school did not violate the Due Process Clause. Even though the court tries to interpret statutes to avoid a constitutional violation, there are well-defined limits to how far courts may go to save a statute. When the Supreme Court finds that a law fails to meet the requirements of our Constitution, the court must declare the law void. It is ironic that the very persons who have criticized the Varnum decision and claimed the court had no authority to overrule the will of the people as expressed in the marriage statute 
are now seeking to have their own constitutional rights protected by the courts by having a law declared unconstitutional. You have no doubt read about the pastor in Sioux City who has advocated against the Supreme Court Justice's retention. Apparently, this advocacy has put the tax-exempt status of the pastor's church in jeopardy because his advocacy against retention allegedly violates a federal law prohibiting such political activity by a tax-exempt organization. The pastor claims this law is unconstitutional and has vowed to challenge the law. Where? In the courts. It seems the pastor is quite comfortable arguing the will of the people as expressed in this federal law can be declared void by the courts. So it seems to me the real criticism by the court's critics is not that the court had no power to declare an unconstitutional statute void. The court clearly did have that authority. Rather, the critics simply disagree with the result. This reaction to the Varnum decision comes as no surprise. It is a rare day when someone does not disagree with the court decision, and court decisions involving an interpretation of the Constitution are no exception. After all, someone always loses, and when the decision addresses important social issues, the response is predictably even more intense. But regardless of whether a particular result will be popular, courts must, under all circumstances, protect the supremacy of the Constitution. Only by protecting the supremacy of the Constitution can citizens be assured that our Republican form of government and the freedoms and rights set out in the Constitution will be preserved. As Justice Robert H. Jackson observed decades ago in reference to the United States Constitution, the very purpose of limiting the power of the elected branches of government by constitutional provisions like the Equal Protection Clause is to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes, the uncertainty, of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities and officials, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. The same principle applies to the provisions of the Iowa Constitution that limit government power. Delegates debating the Iowa Constitution recognized and discussed this concept. Courts are better suited to protect individual rights because courts are free from the political influences that are found in the other two branches of government. On the other hand, the Iowa Constitution, like the United States Constitution, provides a process for changing constitu constitutional interpretations that citizens don't like. That process is to amend the Constitution, to override the court's decision. In this way, the people always have the last say about the content and meaning of the Constitution. As you know, however, amending the Constitution is a difficult and slow process. It is much easier for some people to simply complain about lawless courts running amok and exceeding their authority. Believe me, heated criticism of court decisions is nothing new. Let me read three comments which may sound familiar to you. The court threw out sound judicial precedent, repudiated the greatest legal minds of our age, and lowered itself to the level of common politics. The justices abandoned their role as judges of the law and organized themselves into a group of social engineers. The decision of the court is a flagrant abuse of judicial power. This sort of criticism is certainly prevalent today. However, you may be surprised to learn that these particular comments were aimed at the United States Supreme Court after its 1954 decision in Brown v. Board of Education, which struck down government-sanctioned segregation in public schools. The unanimous Brown decision unleashed a firestorm of criticism. Of course, the Brown decision is now universally respected. But at the time the Supreme Court decided the Brown case, the court had three justices from the Deep South, Hugo Black from Alabama, Tom Clark from East Texas, and Stanley Reed from Kentucky. They had to have known the Brown decision would make them unwelcome at home, and it did. Nevertheless, they did not let that pressure influence their decisions on this important civil rights case. 
I mention the Brown case to illustrate the fact that complaints about judicial review of constitutional, constitutional issues are not uncommon or new, nor are these complaints confined to one political point of view. Early in the last century, President Theodore Roosevelt and like-minded progressive politicians condemned the federal courts for invalidating popular legislative reforms. Nearly 30 years later, liberal politicians denounced U.S. Supreme Court rulings that invalidated some of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies in the 1930s. Conservatives denounced Supreme Court rulings in the 1970s that limited anti-abortion laws and upheld a right to privacy. More recently, liberals have criticized the United States Supreme Court decisions that struck down gun regulations and campaign finance laws as unconstitutional. As you can see, criticism of judges by those unhappy with court decisions is nothing new. But despite the political fallout of any particular court decisions, judges must follow the Constitution, which states that a law inconsistent with the Constitution must be declared void. This requirement of our Constitution contains no exceptions. So even though a law may be supported by strong and deep-seated traditional beliefs and popular opinion, if it violates our Constitution, we the people have said in our Constitution that the law must be declared void. As I've mentioned, one of the most recent controversies to find its way to the Iowa Supreme Court is the question of same-sex same marriage. Presently, Iowans are debating the Iowa Supreme Court's unanimous 2009 decision that held an Iowa statute limiting civil marriage to a union between a man and a woman violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Iowa Constitution. I'm not here tonight to debate the Varnum decision. The court allows its decisions to speak for themselves. Nonetheless, it is important to at least review what that decision was about, and perhaps more importantly, what it was not about. Because allegations that the Supreme Court overstepped its authority in that decision are based on a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Varnum decision was all about. An accurate understanding of the narrowness of the court's ruling goes a long way in addressing the criticisms that are currently being directed at the court. The law at issue in the Varnum decision was a statute in which the legislature created a civil contract it called marriage. This statute defined marriage as a civil contract requiring the consent of the parties capable of entering into other contracts except as herein otherwise provided. In other words, the court considered a statute governing a legal contract, not the religious sacrament, right, or institution of marriage. Let me read from the decision. Our Constitution, our Constitution does not permit any branch of government to resolve religious debates and entrust to courts the task of ensuring government avoids them. The statute at issue in this case does not prescribe a definition of marriage for religious institutions Instead, the statute declares marriage is a civil contract and then regulates that civil contract. Thus, in pursuing our task in this case, we proceed as civil judges, far removed from a theological debate of religious clerics, and focus only on the concept of civil marriage and the state licensing system that identifies a limited class of persons entitled to secular rights and benefits associated with civil marriage. State government can have no religious views, either directly or indirectly, expressed through its legislation. This proposition is the essence of the separation of church and state. As a result, civil marriage must be judged under our constitutional standards of equal protection and not under religious doctrines or the religious views of individuals. And what is that constitutional standard the court applied in Varnum? the Equal Protection Clause, Iowans included in their constitution when Iowa became a state. It provides all laws of a general nature shall have a uniform operation. The General Assembly shall not grant to any citizen or class of citizens 
privileges or immunities which, upon the same terms, shall not equally belong to all citizens. The controversy over this decision has erupted into a retention election battle as well as calls to change the way Iowans select their judges. I urge Iowans to question whether we should dismantle Iowa's highly regarded merit selection system because of one controversial decision. Iowans used to elect judges by popular partisan elections, but over 42 years ago, Iowans decided to insulate judges from the political fray and select judges based upon merit. Merit selection is considered the best way to choose judges because it emphasizes professional qualifications and de-emphasizes partisan politics. This far-sighted constitutional provision ensures that we have high caliber judges of utmost integrity who are selected and retained based upon their professional qualifications, not ideologies, not politics. How does merit selection work? The merit selection system revolves around an independent commission that screens applicants for judicial office and then provides the governor with a slate of nominees from which to select a judge or justice. There is one nominating commission that is responsible for sending the governor nominations for the Iowa Supreme Court and the Iowa Court of Appeals. In addition, there is a nominating commission for each of our 13 judicial subdistricts. These commissions are responsible for making nominations for appointment to the district court. Each nominating commission is chaired by a judge and is composed of an equal number of lawyers elected by their peers and other citizens selected by the governor. Commissioners selected by the governor are subject to Senate confirmation. They serve for terms of six years and those terms are staggered. I can tell you from my personal experience that I was nominating commissioners put applicants for judicial office through a rigorous and thorough screening. Commissioners review extensive information about each applicant's background, education, professional skills, and experience. To discourage commissioners from inserting their political ideology and agendas into this process, the judicial branch with the aid of the American Judicature Society provides periodic education programs for nominating commissioners. These programs are designed to impress upon commissioners the important role they play in maintaining fair and impartial courts. As part of this education program, commissioners learn how to conduct fair interviews that focus on evaluating an applicant's professional skills, legal knowledge, temperament, and demeanor, and that de-emphasize politics. One of the complaints about the merit selection system that has come to the surface this election year is the assertion that the commissions are currently dominated by members who are registered Democrats. The critics point to this situation as evidence that we have judges who are more interested in politics instead of the rule of law. It is interesting that similar concerns were expressed in a May 1986 editorial in the Des Moines Register that discussed complaints that Republican Governor Terry Branstad had packed the commissions with Republicans. Nonetheless, when I applied for the Iowa Supreme Court in 1993, the Brandstad appointed nominating commissioners focused on my professional qualifications and refrained from turning the process into a political litmus test. The commission placed its attention on the quality of my work and my propensity for impartiality. And in my interview with Governor Brandstad and Lieutenant Governor Joy Corning, the questions again focused on my professional qualifications. I have no reason to believe the current commissioners appointed by Democratic governors have conducted themselves differently than their Republican predecessors, focusing on the professional skills and qualifications of the applicants and nominating those most qualified. Now let's turn to the other aspect of our merit selection process, retention elections. As most of you know, in a retention election, a judge runs unopposed and voters simply vote whether or not to retain a judge for another term. The original idea behind retention elections is in keeping with a merit-based system. If we select our judges based on merit, not politics, the question of whether they remain in office should likewise be based on merit, not politics. Like merit selection, the retention election process greatly reduces the need for campaigns 
and campaign fundraising and thus protects the integrity of our fair and impartial courts. At the same time, the retention election provides voters with a way to remove from office incompetent or unethical judges. Contrary to the view of some special interest groups and politicians upset with, by the Varnum decision, the merit selection system works as it was intended to work, producing competent judges who perform their work impartially, fairly, and in strict accordance with the rule of law. It has served Iowans well for nearly 50 years, and it is worth saving. Since becoming Chief Justice, I have had the privilege of talking with Chief Justices from other states. Many of these Chief Justices hold Iowa's judiciary in high regard. They view our bench as being one of the most capable, ethical, and impartial in the nation. A recent survey of Iowa lawyers conducted by the Iowa State Bar Association. Did I skip something here? There we go. A recent survey of Iowa lawyers conducted by the Iowa State Bar Association confirmed the validity of this reputation. <coughs> Judges were rated above average or higher on the various professional skills and traits important to a competent and fair jurist. In addition, surveys conducted for the United States Chamber of Commerce, which is not generally described as a liberal organization, consistently rank Iowa's judges among the most fair and impartial when compared to judges in other state court systems. It is no secret that Iowa's high standing in these rankings is, in large part, a result of our merit selection system for choosing judges. It is interesting to note that most of the states that received high marks in the chamber survey use merit selection to choose their judges. Most of the low-ranking states elect their judges. For example, in August, the Des Moines Register printed an op-ed piece by a Supreme Court Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court who touted popular partisan elections, the Alabama style of selecting judges, as a better way to select judges. Where do Alabama judges fall in the U.S. Chamber survey? Of the 50 state court systems, Alabama judges rank near the bottom, 47th in terms of impartiality. I doubt most Iowans care to emulate Alabama in this regard. The bottom line, combining courts and politics produces poor results. Courts are less likely to be fair and impartial when judges succumb to the pressure to make popular decisions, whether to satisfy contributors from the last election or to gain support for the next election. Let me give you an example, a case that reached the United States Supreme Court last year, Caperton, Caperton versus A.T. Massey Coal Company. Now the name Massey Coal Company may sound familiar to you. Massey is the company that owns the Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia where a mine explosion killed 29 manor, miners last April. Now the case I'm talking about is, does not involve that, but it is the same uh, party. In the Caperton case, a jury awarded Mr. Caperton $50 million against Massey Coal Company for damages caused by the coal company's fraud and intentional destruction of Mr. Caperton's business. Massey appealed to the West Virginia Supreme Court. Now West Virginia elects its judges and it just happened that a judicial election was coming up. The coal company's president, knowing the coal company's appeal would come before the West Virginia Supreme Court, decided to support Brent Benjamin, an attorney who was running against a justice on the court. Massey's president contributed over $3 million to a group supporting Benjamin's campaign to win a seat on the West Virginia Supreme Court. Benjamin won that election, and he took his seat on the court just in time to hear the appeal in the Caperton case. Even though most of the money spent to elect Justice Benjamin to the court came from Massey's president, Benjamin refused to recuse himself from the coal company, from Mr. Caperton's appeal. So all five justices on the West Virginia Supreme Court heard the appeal in Caperton versus Massey Coal Company, and they reversed the $50 million judgment against the coal company on a vote of three to two. 
Caperton lost his verdict by one vote. Any guess how Justice Benjamin voted? You're right, in favor of Massey Coal Company. Fortunately, that's not the end of the story. Caperton appealed to the United States Supreme Court. That court reversed the West Virginia Supreme Court, holding that a fair hearing in a fair tribunal is a basic requirement of due process, and Caperton did not receive that in the West Virginia Supreme Court. This case is an example of what can happen when politics and money become part of the judicial selection process. Critics of the courts like to say, however, that unelected judges are out of touch with the people and not accountable to the will of the people. This statement implies that courts make decisions like the other two branches of government. In other words, they expect the courts to rule according to popular public opinion, like politicians often do. This view of the courts is clearly wrong. Although it may be appropriate for politicians to consider public opinion, the views of special interest groups, or even their personal opinion when drafting laws and regulations, it is never appropriate for judges to do so when deciding cases. Judges must remain impartial. Judges must apply the rule of law. While preparing my remarks, I found an article by a Minnesota judge responding to complaints that judges are not accountable to the people. He wrote, it might sound good to have judges accountable to the people, but which people? Should judges be accountable to those who shout the loudest or make the most threats? Should judges be accountable to the majority? If so, what happens to the rights of the minority? And what happens to a judge's responsibility to uphold the law and the Constitution? When a judge starts to worry about who the judge will please or, dis or displease with a ruling, then we cease to be a government based on the rule of law. Intimidating judges is the goal of the out-of-state interest groups that are funding the retention election battle in Iowa. Iowa for Freedom, which is a program of the Mississippi-based organization AFA Action Inc., wants our judges to be servants of this group's ideology rather than servants of the law. Naturally, critics of courts want the people to believe that unpopular court decisions are the result of biased judges who ignore or twist the law to fit a particular ideology. Although this may hold some popular appeal, in reality, it is just not true. These critics are blinded by their own ideology. They simply refuse to accept that an impartial, legally sound and fair reading of the law can lead to an unpopular decision. As former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has said, the law sometimes demands unpopular outcomes and a judge who is forced to weigh what is popular rather than focusing solely on what the law demands has lost some impartiality. Rest assured, Iowans have fair and impartial justice. And what do I mean by fair and impartial justice? Fair and impartial justice means our judges and the process for resolving legal disputes are even-handed, applying the law equally to all people. It means courts issue rulings free from intimidation, interference, and political influence. It does not mean that everyone will agree with court decisions or that courts are immune from error, but it does mean that courts are accountable to the law and above all else, accountable to the people's constitution. And in this way, courts are always accountable to the people. At the end of the day, the debate about controversial court decisions and the judges who make them boils down to a simple question. What kind of court system do we want? A court system that issues rulings based upon public opinion polls, campaign contributions, political intimidation, or a court system that issues impartial rulings based on the rule of law? 
Before you vote in the retention elections this year, reflect on the rule of law and the need for impartial justice for all, free of politics and free of special interest. In November, you will be voting on more than whether to retain any particular judge. Make no mistake about it. You will be voting for the kind of court system you want in the future. It will be your opportunity to show what Iowans believe in, what Iowans stand for. I hope that you will all stand for maintaining Iowa's fair and impartial judiciary. Iowans deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have the room for a little bit longer if there yep. are a few uh, questions. Thank you, Chief Justice Turnus. If anybody has questions, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, th there's not going to be any doubt about people knowing the judges are on the ballot and probably something about them. Uh, but in most retention elections, a lot of people don't vote because they know nothing about the people. And that is. Okay. Well, it, in most cases, people don't know, you know much about district court judges. I think anything that appears on the ballot. Now, I, I assume you can have a website in which there's some information, all right? Um, Iowans typically, I mean, never, never have I gone to the polls with anything that Iowa ever provides as far as information. Uh, and I hail from California where we get a thick book, right, with all of our propositions, <laughs> you know. But we don't have any information. Well, we don't have now. Much. This year we have information, but that's that's based upon this issue. It's not uh, the fact the issue that's come up. It's not that there's a practice of giving us any information. Well, actually, every year we do have information on our website that gives um, biographical uh, information about judges, their professional qualifications, kind of the information that you heard a little bit in my introduction. And we actually do have those on our website. Right. Have no idea what doing. Yeah. I, I don't know. Did we have brochures back in the days before electronic? I do have somebody from my office. No, you're right. Yeah. So I don't know how long have we, maybe the last 2006. 2006. So we've had it for, this would be the third election that we've had information on our websites. Um, and we did bring some brochures tonight that have the address for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, we also, there is also the plebiscite that I mentioned in my remarks that the Iowa State Bar Association conducts, and that's another source of information that's available on their website, and we have a link to it on our website as well. Again, you know, it's really wonderful that we have this electronic means of communication because it does make that information much more accessible. One of the problems we face here in Ames that I discovered is for the last many elections, very few registered voters come out to vote. Um, in Ames, it has been like 3 to 5 percent vote and 97 percent do not vote. Only the last two elections with the Aquatic Center and with a council election, 14 percent showed up, but 86 did not. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems you're going to face here is the aggressive suggestions in the television, which is a, just a hypnotic one-eyed Satan, they will get these people to think differently than they should. Mm -hmm. And anything the government can do at all levels to get more people out involving in this participatory democracy idea is going to work out well. But so few vote here in Ames that I have no idea how that would go if they just had an Ames-only vote. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a little army in this room of people who now know the importance of this election. And so I think it's every citizen's responsibility to see that it's more than three or four percent who turn out for this election and that they're informed about the real uh, 
uh, meaning of the votes that are going to be cast in this retention election and what it would do for the court system in the future. So I hope that um, those of you who have been here tonight who perhaps are persuaded that this is an important issue and that people do need to get out to vote will urge your neighbors and family and friends to do that. Hopefully you all have email. You get chain letters all the time, don't you? Do, do you guys ever, you know, send them out, send them to 10 people within five minutes, and I'm thinking, oh my God, something bad's gonna happen, I don't have time to send this. Um, you know, send, send something out to your friends. Let them know about what's going on here, and that what they see in these sound bites from this Mississippi organization is not the whole story, because it's not. Uh, yes? Well, and the fact that there are, uh, that, that there is this organiza organized opposition is one reason that I think it's important for members of the court to get out and talk to the, in, the, in the communities and let you know what is really happening here. Uh, but I can't talk to everybody in the city. That I, I'm relying on those of you to um, talk to your neighbors about this issue, talk to your family and friends. Well, I have a question mm -hmm. about the Constitutional Convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that uh, threaten the independent judiciary, too? Is that the idea? Uh, nobody talks about it, though. Well, Nobody's you know, the, the, the mere fact that, that there is a Constitutional Convention or that there might be a Constitutional Convention is not in and of itself any threat to the judiciary. I would hate to see a Constitutional Convention um, devolve into a debate about how we select and retain judges. We have a good system here that is the envy of a lot of states. Um, and I know that there are some people who are advocating for the Constitutional Convention to address that issue, and I would certainly hope that that doesn't happen. We have a jewel and we need to protect it. Will your remarks be available on the website? Um, Pat, I yes. I think we, oh, I'll let Pat talk about that. There will be a podcast available online. So, I have a question to follow up on Susan's. If we have a constitutional convention, does that open up the Constitution A to Z? Or is it just one phrase that would be, or one clause that would be altered? It's the whole thing, right? We start from scratch? You know, <laughs> just because I'm the Chief Justice doesn't mean I know all these uh, details. Um, but but I, I do think that anything, um, once the appropriate procedures are followed, would be um, up for discussion. But what, those, what the process is for identifying those issues, I'm not sure. Dr. Shelley might be able to clear that up. We have an expert right in our midst. No. no. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I did just read uh, the Iowa Constitution Article 10, Section 3, regarding a constitutional convention, and it does not even say how the delegates are chosen for it. It says the next General Assembly would choose the method of choosing the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. So it's awfully wide open. Mm -hmm. There's just not very much at all about to guarantee what, or give you an idea of what could happen. Mm -hmm. Any more Anything questions? Else? You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Good night.